This next topic is of great interest to me because it has to do with alien abductions. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, you know, and they say, well, how do you know it didn't happen, this kind of thing? And do you, do you deny that these people had a real experience? I get asked this a lot. No, I don't deny that they had a real experience. The experience was real. The question is, what does the experience represent? Something here or something out there? Well, that's what we're doing here, is to discuss what happens when things happen up here. Richard McNally is our next speaker from Harvard University, where he studies cognitive differences in university presidences. And... Uh, <laughs> Now, he conducts research on memories. Memories are interesting. True memories, false memories, recovered memories, repressed memories, remembered memories. In fact, he's the author of Remembering Trauma. We have his book. It's a well-received book. Uh, in a way, I was a little disheartened that it, it came out when it did because I thought all that stuff had, had finally gone away, the whole recovered memory movement and the satanic panic and all the alien abductions, all this stuff about... Uh, all the legal aspects of it. I thought this had really gone down by the end of the 90s, and clearly it, it is not the case. And in fact, Dr. McNally has himself experienced the emotional buzzsaw of this whole industry of people that are into this whole recovered memory thing, especially with now the whole uh, Catholic church business with the priests and all that, you know, and light, the latest guy convicted solely on, apparently, recovered memory. So it's still around. It's still in the courts. It's still a big factor in society, which means it's important. Richard uh, wrote the uh, classic article. This is my favorite, uh, probably one of my favorite article titles I've ever seen. This was in Psychological Science, a very prestigious journal. Psychophysiological Responding During Script-Driven Imagery in People Reporting Abduction by Space Aliens. <laughs> that has to be the only time the word space aliens has appeared in an academic journal. <laughs> Dr. McNally received his BS in psychology from Wayne State and his PhD in clinical psych from the University of Illinois at Chicago. He joined the Harvard faculty in 1991, where he's been uh, ever since. His general research, actually, in addition to all this, is on uh, phobias, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, application of cognitive psychology methods to elucidate information processing abnormalities in anxiety disorders, panic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, in, uh, as well as the study of uh, memory in people reporting childhood sexual abuse. So today he's going to talk to us about all this good stuff. Please help me welcome Dr. Richard McNally. Thank you very much for that introduction, but I think you may get me in trouble with my president. So, <laughs> so for the record, I'm not conducting uh, uh, studies on cognitive abilities and, and presidents. Uh, the, um, uh, my talk title today here is Explaining the Space Alien Abduction Phenomenon. I guess you might consider it sort of the, the subtitle because it's sort of a, um, it's not the title, it's actually in the program, which is a more broader one, and Michael and I had talked about this, and I figured that probably given the 30-minute uh, time frame, that what I would like to do is just focus in on, on the two studies we did on this particular topic. Uh, but uh, by way of introduction, uh, several years ago, our research group was conducting a positron emission tomography study, a PET study, on women who had been sexually abused as uh, children. There were CSA cases. We had ads in the newspaper recruiting women with these types of histories, and we would bring them in, and we would conduct um, psychiatric diagnostic interviews to see which of those had post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and those uh, who did not. Now, in the course of about seven days, seven, ten days, I had three strange experiences doing these uh, diagnostic interviews, and they're all exactly alike. What happened is when I got to the part uh, of the interview where I asked, uh, when were you abused, you know, what had happened, who the perpetrator was, and so forth, in each case, the potential subject that we'd recruited said, I don't know. My first thought is that she might have you know, misread the ad in the newspaper. That turned out not to be the case. And so then I asked as politely as I could, you know, how is it that you responded to an ad seeking adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse, but you have no memories of ever having been abused? I said, well, that's easy. I eat too much, and I make myself throw up. 
My mood changes unpredictably. I have nightmares that I cannot explain. I feel tense around my stepfather. I don't know why. I, I must have been sexually abused and I can't remember it. So at any event, we obviously could not use these individuals in the PET study because the PET study recorded memories, okay? But uh, it did prompt a research program that my colleagues and I embarked upon where we recruited people from the community who reported um, believing they harbored repressed memories of childhood sexual abuse or reported recovering memories of childhood sexual abuse or said they always remembered and so forth, continuous memories. Uh, we've done s uh, several s a series of studies designed to test two general sorts of sets of hypotheses. In one case, we're testing hypotheses about mechanisms that ought to be operative if people can, in fact, sort of banish, if you will, memories of childhood sexual abuse and then later recall them. Or if they can form false memories of childhood sexual abuse uh, when, in fact, these things did not happen. Now, one problem that we had in doing this research, especially on the recovered memory subjects, it was often difficult to tell whether someone had, in fact, been abused, fondled, perhaps, as a child, didn't think about it for many years, and then was reminded of it later, which would be technically a recovered memory, but without repression, if you will, inaccessibility, or whether they had false memories of abuse that were not, in fact, true. We had, for example, in one of our studies, uh, a study that caused a predictable uproar, uh, found heightened false memory propensity in a simple cognitive psychology task in the laboratory in a women who'd reported me recovering memories of childhood sexual abuse. Of course, we didn't know how many of these subjects really were abused and which ones were not. We could not corroborate any, but not corroborating them doesn't mean the memory is false. It's a very subtle problem here. So what we decided then to do uh, is to study a group of individuals for whom we are fairly sure have false memories of trauma, false recovered memories. And let me just tell you who the we is here in terms of the studies that I'll be presenting. Uh, my collaborators, Susan Clancy, Natasha Lasko, Mark Lenzenweger, um, Mike Macklin, Scott Orr, Roger Pittman, and Dan Schachter. So what we did, we uh, put an uh, ad in the newspaper, have you been abducted by aliens? Researchers at Harvard are seeking adults to participate in memory study, who believe in been abducted by aliens, et cetera, et cetera. For further information, please call Susan. That's Susan Clancy, who was my uh, PhD student at the time. Now, it was very funny, because right around this time, uh, I'm in the Department of Psychology uh, at Harvard, but this gentleman here, John Mack, was uh, a professor of psychiatry uh, at Harvard Medical School. His, um, uh, he was, uh, uh, he was in, uh, uh, his clinic was based at Cambridge Hospital. That's a few blocks away from where I am in the psychology department. He was in psychiatry. And it was very funny. I, I was telling John about this. I said, you know, we've been studying the, you know, the childhood sex abuse cases, but uh, I figure I'm going to move into the space alien abductee business. And he said, how are you going to get your subjects? I said, put an ad in the newspaper, like I always do. And he says to me, Rich, you put an ad in the paper, and you're not going to get real experiencers, real abductees. I said, what do you mean not real ones? <laughs> and he goes, well, you're going to get people calling up in response to your ad, placing messages on your answering machine at your lab and so forth, playing jokes on you, doing things of that sort. Boy, was he right. <laughs> I mean, just to give you an idea, as Michael mentioned, most of the work I've done is with panic, agoraphobia, OCD, et cetera, et cetera. These guys are different. It's a different experience. I mean, just to give you some idea before I get into the data, for example, we had this one guy. Every morning we come in, we see the light flashing on the answering machine. Oh, oh we got you know, some subjects calling in. And, and we play the thing. It's the same guy. This went on for every day for two weeks. It went something like this. <laughs> Talking like he's R2-D2, making it like he's some kind of space alien himself. <laughs> you have to erase. <sighs> so we did. So Mac was right. Yeah. But we also had people who were much more sophisticated. I remember one time, you know, the... the we got the message blink, and this time we erase R2-D2. We get to the next message, and it goes something like this. Hello, this is uh, Bob Wilson from Boston Chevrolet. I read your ad in the newspaper. I know you're seeking uh, individuals who have been abducted by aliens. I, I've been abducted. I'd like to hear a little bit more about your memory study. So please call me at Boston Chevrolet, 555 <laughs> So Clancy and myself were thinking, we got ourselves a live one here, you know. And so she calls back, and the guy who answers the phone says something like this. Hi, this is uh, Bob Wilson. Uh, are you in the market for a car today? That's how they talk in Boston. 
and, and she says, no, I'm not in the market for a cat today. Uh, I, I'm responding to the message that you left on our answering machine. She goes, message? She goes, yes, you, you had mentioned that you've been abducted by aliens and are interested in participating in our memory study. He goes, aliens, what are you talking about? At this point, all the other salesmen at Boston Chevrolet you know, burst out laughing as the real Bob Wilson slams down the phone. You know. So I say it's different. By the way, these are, these are true stories. These are not Irish facts. An, an Irish fact is something that's, tr uh, that's not true but would make a heck of a great story if it were true, by the way. Uh, Mac himself, of course, is the author of Abduction, Human Encounters uh, with Aliens, as I think everybody here knows. He was also the winner of the Pulitzer Prize in 1977 from his book on Lawrence uh, of Arabia. Okay, so uh, the first of our two studies um, that we did, this was directly inspired by the uh, ambiguities with the sexual abuse uh, study. Are people who report abduction by space aliens prone to develop false memories in the laboratory? In other words, is the same sort of general false memory propensity present in this group that also has recovered these sorts of memories? Okay, let me tell you a little bit about the subjects that we've recruited here, uh, our quote unquote real abductees. Um, the, uh, oh, we did find them, uh, so to speak. We got some referrals from Mac, we found others through the, the newspapers and what have you. But um, uh, let me just sort of describe what they're, what they're like. You know, we asked them, uh, how did this all begin? And they would say something like this, this is the modal subject. You know, would, would say, well, I was lying in bed one night on my back. A few hours before dawn, I woke up, I could see my bedroom in the semi-darkness. I went to roll over in bed, and I realized I couldn't move. I was absolutely paralyzed, totally terrified. I'm sitting there like this, my eyes open, I can't move. And then suddenly, electrical sensations start coursing through my body. I start hearing this zzz, zzz, humming sound. I see lights flashing. I begin to levitate off of the bed, and suddenly I sense a presence in the room with me. I look around because I can move my eyes even though I can't move my body, and suddenly these beings are starting coming up towards the bed. At this point, I'm scared out of my wits. I have no idea what's going on, and I wake up after some particular time later. I'm not sure how long it was. Totally baffled and terrified. Now, it turns out what this apparently is, is an episode of so-called sleep paralysis accompanied by hypnopompic, or upon awakening, hallucinations. Basically, what I think is going on with our folks, and they all tell us this, is that during rapid eye movement sleep, REM sleep, the stage of sleep when we do most of our dreaming, we're completely paralyzed. Of course, we don't know that because we're asleep. Uh, and it's a good thing, too, that we're paralyzed, because otherwise we might get out and act out our dreams and hurt ourselves. But in one of these episodes, which is really no more pathological than a case of the hiccups, 